and, and let's get right to uh, the developments that surrounded the, uh, the lawsuit that we filed against uh, HHS, and, HHS and FDA and against Secretary Becerra, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the acting uh, uh, FDA Commissioner, uh, Janet Woodcock. And our purpose, frankly, in filing that lawsuit was to draw attention to the fact that the FDA was not acting, in our opinion, in good faith in the collection of these comments. And the reason that we believe that is that they, uh, the, the Department of State, State received the notice from the World Health Organization that they were commencing a pre-review of Kratom among five or six other substances that would take place in Geneva on October the 11th. They waited, the FDA waited 42 days before they then filed the required federal register notice and then limited the amount of time that was available for commenters to submit comments. And, and the theory here is that you should have time to formulate the comments, to collect information if you choose to submit it. That was particularly critical for a group of scientists who obviously have done a lot of research into Kratom uh, and their ability to, to put all of that together and submit it. The FDA limited the time from, from July 23rd to August the 9th, which is about 11 business days. Clearly, that was, in our opinion, inadequate, and we wanted the public to see that. Uh, it is without question enormously difficult to get a judge uh, to rule against a federal agency, particularly when the challenge is we have to prove irreparable harm. And so when we got into the hearing, our attorneys made the case about the bad faith of the FDA and HHS in, in the way that they handled this particular issue and evidence provided the evidence of a longstanding hostility that the FDA has held towards Kratom uh, and documented that with the information. The judge uh, was particularly interested in knowing why the FDA waited the 42 days before they published the notice and limited the comment period. The FDA could not provide any adequate answer to that question uh, because there isn't any. Frankly, uh, they, they, they delayed it purposely. Uh, there's not any reason to do so. Uh, the only other thing that, that, of course, we know why, which is that, that they, they wanted to limit the comment period because they didn't want to hassle with it. Uh, when we learned that the FDA did not intend to submit those comments because legally under the Controlled Substances Act statute, they only have to consider them. So all of that was presented to the judge. The judge made it very clear that she was unhappy with the way that this, this matter had been handled. And, but she said that we failed on our test of irreparable harm because despite the fact that the FDA had limited the comment period, we still on the FDA site had 6,000 comments and we had, uh, at that point of the hearing, uh, close to 50,000 comments. We now have, I think, 53,000 comments that have been collected. Maybe it's even higher than that. And so the judge's point was, well, it sounds like a lot of people uh, were, were commenting, uh, and it sounds like you're going to be able to, based on the strategy articulated by the AKA, uh, you're going to be able to, to uh, transmit those comments, which should have weight. But she made it clear still that she was unhappy with the uh, the FDA and HHS. Uh, now, the, the government was represented by a Department of Justice attorney, an assistant U.S. attorney, and the FDA attorney was on, on the, the, the action, in the hearing on this Zoom call that they held because of COVID in this hearing. And uh, the, the assistant U.S. attorney was obviously embarrassed by the lack of, of uh, an excuse or a reason why the FDA had delayed in, the, the, uh, the, in, in actually collecting and publishing the Federal Register Notice and had to admit under the judge's questioning that they actually have until August the 27th to complete all of the gathering of comments. Uh, and the judge questioned them as to if they were truly going to consider the comments, which they are required by law to do, why did they set the August 9th deadline and then say to the court in their original court filing that they were due to be submitted on August the 10th to the WHO? And the FDA said uh, on the record that in fact, uh, they had just learned uh, that the, uh, the deadline for the submission of the comments had been changed to August 27th. 
I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know whether that was changed or there's always the date and whether this is just another example of the hubris of the FDA. Notwithstanding all of that, uh, after some discussion uh, within the context of the judge's criticism, the US attorney at the Department of Justice determined that they will reopen the comment period and that will be in the federal register uh, on Monday, August the 16th. And we will have then until August 24th in order to continue to collect comments. We want to collect as many comments as we can. And while 50,000 or 53,000 is a good number, it is not yet at an impressive number because we want to be able to show uh, at the, the WHO that there is an overwhelming uh, outpouring of complaints about what the FDA is proposing to be done at the WHO with respect to a pre-review and we want to convince the expert committee on drug dependence at the WHO that they should not proceed with a full critical review. And so every single comment is going to be critical. And we need to take advantage of the next couple of weeks until August the 24th and, and beat the bushes and find every person we can. I know that there are many, many people out there that uh, were intimidated by this process because of the time frame that was involved. Um, we now have this opportunity, which we should seize in order to get as many of those comments as we can get in. And that means uh, asking you, asking you to please reach out to your, your network, your friends. We are going to continue uh, to, to work with vendors and encourage them to put the materials up on their cash register so that their customers can easily sign up by just scanning a QR code. We're going to do it with the online vendors. We need to do every single thing we can uh, in order to, uh, uh, to take care of getting this goal set of having somewhere north of 75,000 to 100,000 comments. Uh, and that's really achievable if we work hard at it and get it done. Uh, now, there has been some, uh, some that have confused, and it's our own fault, some have confused this issue a little bit by telling people, well, go sign up at both. Uh, that, is, that, is a, that is not the right procedure. We, we guarantee that every single one of the comments that you submit to the AKA portal at protectkratom.org will be submitted. We are going to do our best to capture as many of the comments that are made on the, the uh, government site as we can. But we don't know at this point how many of the 6,000 that are in the federal site are actually duplicates. And it was a mistake for people to be saying and advising, you know, go sign up on both, because that wasn't a safety factor. That was just creating a real hassle for us in order to dedupe the duplicates. But we're going to do it. And I just encourage everyone to use the, uh, the AK's uh, portal, which is the protectkratom.org site, and file your comments there, because then you're guaranteed that you're going to have your comment actually registered and listened to. Um, and it is critical that we do that uh, because the truth is, the FDA has the ability to, in their evaluation, slow walk that. And they, they may not provide the data to us in time to submit it by the deadline of August the 27th uh, with the, the, uh, the, the WHO expert committee. The process that we're working against here is that this is a very tight, tight, tight timeline. And even though the meeting isn't until October 11th, uh, we have got to have all these materials in by the end of August. And we are working hard at recruiting other countries to participate with us. Uh, we have websites up in Indonesia and, and uh, in Thailand and in the Philippines. We're going to work with Malaysia, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, we're working with Canada. Uh, we're working with uh, the European countries so that they can weigh into the, uh, to the expert committee and say that this is not a, a, a recommendation that is ready for prime time. The evidence is clear that the, the position taken by the FDA is embarrassingly poor evidence and data, and that nothing has changed since Dr. Zhuwa made that observation in his independent evaluation uh, for the, uh, uh, for the, the eight-factor analysis that, that the FDA had submitted, and the basis for his withdrawing uh, all of those, uh, uh, the, those recommendations. So uh, our challenge is that by the deadline of August the 24th, in order to submit everything by August the 27th, so our deadline's the 24th to collect 
all of the comments that we can, and we will then commit to have those transmitted by the deadline the WHO is set of August 27th, assuming that deadline holds, we will have our comments in along with the scientific data, along with the statements of a variety of scientists and stakeholders that are involved in this process and with our request for appearances before the expert committee uh, on October the 11th. So that's what we're up against. Uh, I don't mean in any way to diminish uh, what we've done. This was a magnificent effort. I know that many people worked very, very hard and now our challenge is to motivate our team to get back out there and beat the bushes and find every person we can that hasn't already done so to start uh, making their comments. And, and you know, sometimes these processes are confusing, they're frustrating, they make us angry. Uh, and, and by the way, we're entitled to that anger given the behavior of the FDA, but the FDA at this point is just manipulating us. And we need to focus on the goal which is for that expert committee. Uh, it was a great outcome because the optics of the FDA bending to the truth, which was that they had manipulated the system, will inure to their detriment, both with policymakers in Washington, DC, with the media, because it was transparent what they were doing. Uh, and this is just something that we have just got to resolve that we're gonna take advantage of. We're gonna, we're gonna articulate this in our talking points that the, this is another example where the FDA does not care about what the rules are. They will do everything and anything they can in order to create a narrative that is anti-Kratom, including uh, limiting the ability of the American people to make comments that they legitimately have legally have the right to do under the Controlled Substances Act. And the fact that the FDA would not in good faith submit our comments to the WHO claiming that they, they're not bound by law to do so uh, shows you how bad things are. So in, in this case, uh, the, the, we, we just need to, do, to buckle down and do everything we can. I'm going to ask uh, Senator Bramble, who's got great experience in the way that the, the government works, to kind of make a few comments here uh, to explain where we are in this process and how important it is that we motivate the troops now to redouble our efforts. So, Kurt, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Mac. Well, I, Mac, I think, I think you said it as articulate articulately as anyone could, uh, now is the time for us to take the fight to the FDA, to take the fight to the World Health Organization. We've taken the fight to the courts uh, on a little skirmish. But this is, this is for all the, the marbles, folks. This is a battle that we have got to win. The FDA is not playing fair. When you look at what they've done, not only the timing uh, at, at every turn, when the FDA puts out a um, a request for proposal on research and then says, but we will own the research and we won't share the research and we'll tell you what, uh, what we're going to allow to be published. All they're trying to do is continue to strengthen their narrative. This is time, if the phrase says, I'm madder than hell and I'm not gonna take anymore, now is the time to, to utter those words, folks, because, because we're in it, uh, we're in it to win it, but we need everyone uh, everyone pulling on the oars. We, ne we need everyone to leave it all on the field of play. We need to get to 100,000 comments to, to get the attention of the government. So Mac, I, like I said, I, I, you were very articulate. You know, on, on several fronts, we're winning. As we go into states, we're winning. As we, we go into, I, I just found out this week, uh, we have a, uh, there was a, a Kratom company that, that was just able to get the, their products into a convenience store chain of some 500 uh, stores. And I learned something. I learned that right now today in America, Kratom is being sold in convenience store gas station chains that the total number of stores, there's about 20 or 25 chains of over hundred stores where Kratom products are being sold. The total number of stores in those 20 or 25 chains totals over 24,000 retail convenience store locations where the, the parent companies have agreed to, to distribute Kratom. Now there's a lot of competitors in the market and whatever, and, and God bless America, you can be fierce competitors when it comes to market share. But when it comes to preserving the, the legality of Kratom, the access to Kratom, the benefits, we are all on one team and we're all in it together. So thanks, Mac. Thanks, Kurt. And, and uh, Kurt's been our champion uh, going forward here. And uh, he's, been, he's been a warrior in fighting uh, against this unfair behavior 
by a government agency that really is one that we ought to be able to trust, but we can't because of, of their actions that they have taken, which have obviously evidenced uh, the clear hubris that's involved here. Uh, in terms of, of just clarifying, and then we're gonna turn it over to question and answers, uh, we have between Monday, and, and let me backtrack, we have right now, we can submit comments to the right place, which is protectkratom.org, uh, and people should be doing that. Uh, but officially, the comment period will be reopened on Monday with the Federal Register notice, and that will send a clear signal that the AKA took the beast to the, to the belly of the beast and we won because we forced them to reopen that comment period. Let's take advantage of it. We have until the 24th in order to get those in. We are gonna to continue to collect in those other countries uh, in their own websites uh, in Indonesia and in Thailand, in the Philippines, and we're gonna open it up in, uh, in Malaysia. We'll do it anywhere where we can find an interest in uh, the, the Kratom issue in any of those countries. We want this to be a worldwide thing. We want those people in Indonesia and Malaysia and, and the other countries to submit their comments to that website um, so that we can keep them separate uh, and, and distinguished from, uh, because some of the arguments are gonna be much different than what, what we provide. Uh, Indonesia is gonna have a different argument pattern. Thailand has a powerful statement to make about how they have just decriminalized Kratom. And as, and as of August the 24th, interesting uh, date uh, confluence there, they are fully, fully opening uh, the uh, Kratom, the growth of Kratom trees to registered smart farmers, they call it, in Thailand. And they had over 100,000 farmers who registered uh, for that opportunity. So they're going to be able to talk about their journey to decriminalize Kratom. And how could the, the uh, WHO now be considering un undoing all of that? Uh, so we, we simply have got to have that fight, take it to them and do it on an individual country by country basis. Everyone we know in America that is part of your social network needs to stand up with us and talk about the freedom. They do not have to be a Kratom user. They have to be someone who believes in freedom. They have to be able to be someone who believes that others that have benefited from a product like Kratom should have the freedom to use it. And the FDA should not be able to do what they have attempted for decades to do, which is to stop uh, Americans from being able to make uh, their own choices, informed choices about dietary supplements, vitamins, and in this case, natural products like Kratom. And the FDA continues their war and, and you can tell them with certainty that the FDA, if they win this battle, will not stop because they're coming for their dietary supplements next. And so everybody ought to be joining in uh, to do that. We are reaching out to stakeholders that are involved in this process across the board. Uh, there's veterans groups here in the United States. There's a lot of, of NGOs, non-government organizations that we are, we are partnering with and encouraging them. I was on a call with uh, over two dozen drug advocacy groups here in Washington, D.C. that coordinate a lot of the advocacy here in the United States, and they were appalled to hear what the FDA was doing, and they're going to join the fight too. Many of them are going to be able to go to the WHO and make statements along the way. We have, we have some of the leading scientists in the world who have committed to stand up for us in Geneva before that WHO expert committee. So I think we've got a good plan. We need your help. Uh, I'll make the appeal not only for, for these comments to get in, uh, but for those of you that can make a contribution, we need it. This is an enormously expensive effort. That lawsuit was expensive. Uh, lawyers don't come cheap. Uh, and the effort that we have to retain these consultants around the world, it's also important. So everybody kind of dig in as best you can, because this is, this is where we are. We, if we lose this battle, it will be a short period of time uh, in, in, as they do the one-year critical review. And then if they recommend to, the, to the, uh, the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs, it will be scheduled. And then the United States will have to follow suit. And you can look at the law and see how certain that is. And if you want to know how successful the WHO is, every one of the substances that they recommended for scheduling in 2020 were approved by the UN Commission. That's the, that's the dire circumstance we're in. We can't let it get to that point. So we're gonna have to fight hard. So I'll turn it back to Pete and uh, glad to answer any questions anyone might have. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mac. I actually didn't know that. That is, uh, that's, wow. Uh, that's that's powerful to know that. A, a couple of questions, uh, 
you, the, the deadline you mentioned is, is the 24th, correct? That's the, that's the deadline for the FDA's new deadline for their comments. We'll okay. keep it open as long as we can, but we have to be able to collect them and, and, and uh, classify them. We want the WHO expert committee to understand this is how many veterans, this is how many law enforcement people, this is how many scientists, medical professionals. And we're going to, we have a team working on that now and thank you to them. Uh, but we're going to want to do that. So we'll, we'll run it as long as we can and still be able to get that information over to the WHO. Absolutely. Because there's going to be a lot of uh, power to be able to talk about uh, the different types of uh, folks who have commented. Uh, somebody wanted to know, are, are we sure that if we submit it through the a, uh, AK, that it will be part of the public record? Oh, yes, because we will submit it to the FDA and they will have to evaluate it. Uh, so, yes. And, and more importantly, we'll do what the, what the FDA refuses to do. And that is oh, maybe we'll shame them into it. But we're going to submit every comment to the WHO. Yeah. And, and for those folks who are asking whether we're getting the media involved, we absolutely are. We've got a very aggressive campaign uh, that we're implementing. And thank you to those who are supporting us financially to make that a, a possibility that we can we can do that. Uh, one thing is just a reminder, if you go to protectkratom.org, you'd be able to find on the website posters that you can download, you can print out, and you can actually take them to your Kratom retail shop. Uh, we, we asked our Kratom Consumer Council member, members to do this a few weeks ago to go to their local Kratom shop and ask them to post the, uh, the, the poster in their shop that shows, make their comments. There's a little QR code that allows people to access it, access it very uh, quickly. So we ask folks to do that. Go to the protectkratom.org website, download that poster, take it into your local shop and ask them to help uh, push folks to, the, uh, to, to make their comments on why Kratom should, should remain legal. Uh, Senator yeah. Bramble, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I was just looking at some of the questions and one of them struck me from uh, one of the attendees. The question is uh, uh, regarding Secretary Becerra, and if he makes a negative recommendation, would that put the nail in the coffin for us? That would be a real challenge. But keep in mind, we are fighting this battle on multiple fronts. We're fighting this battle. We have a lot of friends in Congress, both in the House and the Senate, that we're working with. We're fighting this battle in the courts. We're fighting this battle in the states. We're fighting this battle uh, on every front. And so, no, it would not be good for us if we made a negative recommendation, but, but no, that would, we're not dead. We just can't afford to lose these battles. Absolutely. Well, and I would add to that with, with regard to Secretary Becerra, he's new uh, at HHS. Uh, he is, his answer to uh, Congressman Pocan un, during a hearing under oath, uh, when Congressman Pocan asked him directly about the Kratom issue, uh, Secretary Becerra, in a very naive way, said uh, that he trusted the FDA and that they do everything based on science. Uh, <laughs> now, our education of him is that when it comes to Kratom, that's not true. Uh, if they, in fact, he doesn't have to look very far down the hall where the Assistant Secretary for Health's office had already weighed in as the independent arbiter of that and found the evidence to be embarrassingly poor. And so you don't get that, you know, that high ground of having the science uh, when you see the evaluation by a scientist himself. And by the way, I've said it before, I hope all of you understand this. Uh, Dr. Joa, who was then the Assistant Secretary for Health, tasked by the Controlled Substances Act, delegated from the Secretary of Health and Human Services, said he didn't agree with the FDA, that, that, that the FDA's evidence was wrong. And what he said to me, he said, Mac, he said, I am not a Kratom advocate. He said, I'm an advocate for science. He said, and the FDA failed miserably to meet that burden. So we are going to release a new eight-factor analysis uh, that's going to be out here in the next couple of days. It will be submitted to the WHO, and that's the complete literature uh, review of all the published literature. And this was referenced by Dr. Zhuwa three years ago when he, he submitted his letter rescinding the recommendation. There have been since then a hundred plus new studies peer-reviewed and published that prove the case the Kratom should not be scheduled. So if, if we're gonna do this based on the science, then we're gonna win. If the WHO has the same attitude that Secretary Becerra has, that, oh, we trust the FDA because they do everything on science, then we've got to disabuse them of that notion. And that's gonna take a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle in Geneva with our scientists telling them 
how wrong the FDA is on this issue and giving them the history of where the FDA has been wrong on other issues as well. So uh, that, that's wh where we're going to take the battle and fight hard. You know, one, one of the battles that we're fighting, one of the questions is why is Kratom lumped in with other substances? You can thank the deception, the duplicity, and the propaganda from the FDA. Uh, Scott Gottlieb has referred to Kratom as a dangerous opioid, a dangerous addictive opioid that kills people. Absolutely false without any basis, without any science, without any data. But when you wanna know why this Kratom is being lumped in, it's because the FDA has declared that Kratom is a dangerous opioid. Now, the reality is that Kratom is in, the plant itself is in the coffee family. The eight-factor analysis, Kratom doesn't uh, produce respiratory depression, uh, respiratory arrest. It doesn't pr produce uh, a mental impairment. You guys all know the, the drill that, that Kratom has some real positive attributes. But the question about why is it being lumped in is because our federal government, an agency of the federal government, is blatantly lying, misrepresenting, and they have an agenda. That agenda may or may not be driven by uh, financial interests of big pharma. I personally believe that it is. Uh, and I think I have, there are several clues, several pieces of evidence that would lead a reasonable person to that conclusion. Uh, but the FDA will do everything they can to shut Kratom down. And yet the FDA is charged with public health, safety, and welfare. The FDA has a, they have a committee on, on opioid addiction, and they are charged in this committee to look at all the potential alternatives to, to defeat uh, the opioid epidemic, and yet they refuse to look at Kratom. So, so I'll, I'll give you an, an, an analogy on another problem we have, and Kurt's absolutely right, that the FDA has filled the pipeline, the information pipeline, with their propaganda and disinformation. Uh, but I, when my kids were younger, I coached one of my daughter's basketball teams. And in a particularly tight game, at the end of the game, uh, one of the girls that I was coaching shot the ball and made the basket. The problem was it was on the wrong basket <laughs> and we lost the team because technically the rules say that that's a basket for the other team. And we lost by two points. And it was very disappointing for the kids. It was more disappointing for the parents who thought I was the dumbest coach in the world. Right. And they were right. By the way, I hadn't trained the kids not to shoot the ball when it wasn't the right basket. Uh, we are in that same position within the Kratom industry today. The FDA gets away with a lot of what they say about Kratom because we have companies that are out there promoting their Kratom products using illegal therapeutic claims. We have, have turned over nearly 50 companies that have, are doing exactly that. We've got to clean up that part of the industry. Then there is another problem, and that is there are a group of, of companies in this industry that do not want to make the investments uh, in the good manufacturing standards. I learned today that the FDA had 15 agents posing as buyers at the CHAMP show in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. They went around that show and collected information about Kratom vendors that were labeling their products incorrectly and making observations about whether or not good GMP practices by, by engaging in conversations with these Kratom companies that were pre presenting at the show. And my understanding is they walked away with a treasure trove of information that they're going to use against the Kratom industry because they've identified companies that are not using good GMP practices, and they will use that as a weapon against us. They will beat us with it. And I, I know that Pete and I and, and the board of directors of the AK have been fighting hard to convince this industry that we cannot be the demise of our own selves, that we cannot be shooting ourselves in the foot. We can't be shooting the basket at the wrong hoop. We are gonna lose this battle if we allow that to become the narrative that the FDA has. And the problem is, you know, we look for the, the, the best price on the product, right? The best price is sometimes driven by the fact that the companies that we're buying Kratom from do not invest in the equipment, uh, the personnel, or the record systems that are very intense. In order to be GMP compliant, you have to test every single uh, uh, gram of product that comes in and trace it through the manufacturing process and document each batch of material with testing and documented cleaning procedures between the, the, form, the product formulations. It is a very, very high bar 
But that's what the FDA requirement is. And by the way, if the FDA were doing their job today, if they didn't have this bias against Kratom, if they were regulating Kratom the way that they should be, that's what every Kratom vendor would have to be doing, be doing right today. So it's not like we can cry foul here. The only people that are responsible for failure to use good manufacturing practices to cut corners, to produce a cheaper product, to get a competitive advantage in the marketplace are Kratom vendors who are doing that. Uh, and we can't blame the FDA for going after them. I, I think it's an unfair tactic because there are ways to deal with uh, Kratom vendors that do that rather than claim every Kratom vendor is doing it, just like they did with the impermissible therapeutic claims. So we, we bear some responsibility to clean up our act. And, uh, and I think we need to work hard to do that. Absolutely. And, and as, as you alluded to, we do have some fantastic vendors within this industry who have made the investment to do it the right way. Uh, those, those tend to be the vendors who you see get more involved in uh, fighting to keep Kratom legal. There's a lot of vendors out there, as Mac, you mentioned, who are, who are basically free, freeloading on uh, what these vendors are doing and frankly, what the Kratom consumers are doing. Uh, you all step up every single time we, we, we reach out to try and uh, uh, get donations so we have the resources to continue the fight. You all respond and you do so in, a, in just a very generous way. And unfortunately, there's too many vendors out there who are letting you all um, uh, burden the, 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 or shoulder the burden of the cost. And so uh, if, if you reach out to your vendor, ask them if they're helping to get signatures, helping to get comments for, for this WHO, ask them if they're donating to the, the, the AK and the fight to keep it, keep it legal. And if you find a vendor who is doing that, then, um, then reward them with your business. And, and if they're not, ask them why they're not. Uh, but, okay, but what, yeah, one of, the, uh, one of the questions, does the association have adequate financial resources to fight this? So I'm not part of the association, but, but I will tell you, uh, the, the participants here, this is an incredibly costly proposition. Uh, when you look at the cost of the, the lawsuits, you look at the cost of fighting the FDA, the federal government has unlimited resources. What do we have on our side? We have truth and justice on our side, and that will always win if we press the case. And, and the, the, the goal there is to get to, the, get to Geneva, have the discussion with the scientists and the consultants that can articulate the position that we're taking here that will tell the truth. And, and I think Daniel, uh, and I see in the Q&A is raising a fascinating question. How can we as Kratom advocates be certain that the FDA won't obfuscate the comments, thereby rendering them invalid or worthless when they're submitted? Daniel, that's why we want everyone to submit through the AKA portal, uh, protectkratom.org, because I guarantee you that we will highlight, amplify, tell the story. We will let the Kratom advocates speak for themselves, tell their powerful stories about how Kratom has changed their lives, saved their lives. We will make sure that that's the message they get delivered. We won't let the FDA obfuscate any comment. Now, they're, they're claiming they are not legally bound to submit them anyway. They're not even going to reference them if they can avoid it. We will be the ones delivering those comments to the WHO expert committee. We will be telling the, giving context about these are the lives of people, just like I've said it many times. I've been out in, in legislative hearings throughout the country. And, and when you hear the, the comments made by Kratom consumers who tell their passionate stories, they need to be replicated at the WHO, and we're going to make sure that that happens because that changes the, lie, the, the, the attitudes of these policymakers. Now, we have a unique issue in Geneva where we're going to be talking to anywhere from five to 10 scientists. So we're going to have to have our scientific brigade there telling the story about the science, but we need to humanize this issue because one of the criteria is what is going to be the impact of a ban? That's one of the, one of the questions that are asked. Well, I can tell you what the impact of a ban is going to be through those 100,000 comments that are submitted. That will be the powerful voice, and we, that's why we need to have them there, and that's what the FDA doesn't want to be heard. They want to be able to say, oh, the impact will be that we'll get rid of all these people that are dying of overdoses of Kratom. That's what they'll say without a, a counter argument. They'll say that we're going to get rid of all these companies that are making illegal therapeutic claims because that's what all these companies do. Uh, we'll get rid of all these companies that are formulating bad products and unsafe products because that's what these companies do. We're going to be standing there saying none of that. None of that is true. And I guarantee you that, uh, that we'll do it with sufficient passion that these, uh, these expert committee members will listen uh, if we get the opportunity to be there. 
Excellent. Um, I think that's it on the questions that we have. Uh, Senator Bramble, any additional comments that you wanted to make before we uh, ended the call tonight? Well, first of all, as a policymaker and as the sponsor of the first uh, Creative Consumer Protection Act, I really appreciate the tireless effort of Mac Haddow, Pete uh, Canlan. Uh, Pete, you, you and Mac have been just tireless in, in your uh, pursuit of this. All the folks that are on this call with us, all of the vendors, all of the advocates, this is a team effort. And it's going to take legislators, it's going to take policymakers in the states, it's going to take policymakers in the fed, at the federal level in Congress, it's going to take uh, scientists, it's going to take all of us leaving everything on the field of play. But in my heart of hearts, this is a fight that we're going to win. Well, I, I appreciate those comments. And as anyone can tell you, my, my role is to hold Max bag while he, uh, he takes care of business. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. And uh, Mac, did you have any final comments before we, we ended the call? So just one, uh, and, and this, is, this is the core of this issue. And, and I know what I'm about to say, each one of you can repeat uh, in spades. There's no question about this, but we got a, an email, uh, actually it was a Facebook message uh, from a Kratom consumer who told us that, that her husband uh, had had his life restored. And that he was a former Navy SEAL who defended this country and because of service-related injuries that he was literally debilitated. And, and I asked if he would be willing to get on a Zoom call with us and talk about his experience because obviously we wanted to hear uh, what, he, what he was able to convey. It's not every day that you find a warrior, warrior that will stand up like that and have that experience. And so we wanted to, to vet him to see what his story was. He got on the call with us and he explained that he, he had the, his injuries were so severe that he had to learn to speak again, but he couldn't do that because he was doped out on the treatment therapies that they were giving him that literally made him into that, you know, that uh, uh, the opioid fog that comes from the management of acute and chronic pain that so many physicians and the VA uh, constantly prescribe. And he said he found Kratom. And now his, his ability to convey that story was powerful. He did it beautifully. Uh, and he told his story about how his life is back. And there's an American hero that agreed to go on camera with us. And we're going to go down and, and shoot some film with him to tell that story. Uh, that's the essence of what we're about, right? Because you don't hear that story from the, the purveyors of opioids. The opioids physically can help people manage acute and chronic pain, but the risks that are associated, the very risk that Dr. Jawa talked about, where people end up in a cycle of addiction or they end up in an overdose situation, you don't get that with Kratom. And Kratom saves lives. And that's gonna be the message that we're gonna convey. And, and, and as I listened to this, this hero tell his story, it struck me that in all of the, the testimony that, that Senator Bramble and I have heard around the country, and, and Pete too, because he's been to a number of these hearings, you hear those stories, they're heroes too, because they've fought that, that awful, awful addiction cycle. They've sought to find a way out of, of, of being debilitated by the treatment that is supposed to help them escape the pain. Uh, that's what we're seeing. And so uh, I, I gotta tell you, that, that if we can do justice to those arguments before the WHO, we're gonna, we're gonna slap the FDA down for what they're trying to do at the international stage that they couldn't accomplish here in the United States under the existing criteria for the Controlled Substances Act. And we're gonna be able to do this together if you will all help us and support us. Let's get a lot more comments and let's take that message to the WHO. Absolutely, thank you very much, Mac. Senator Bramble, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank, thank you, you all of you for taking time tonight to join us. We will, do what, we will continue to provide updates as this fight continues. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Take care, everyone. Thank you.